Hello and welcome to this special edition of Greater Somerville. I'm Joe Lynch. My guest today is a former alderman and mayor of the city of Somerville and since 1999 has represented the former 8th Congressional, now the 7th Congressional District in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He currently is running for re-election. It is my pleasure to welcome him back to Somerville Media Center, Congressman Mike Capuano. Hi, Joe. Or should I say your home for it a couple is, of weeks? It is my home, and I'm glad to be here. Yeah, and the family is great. It, it, very fun. grateful to see you back for a couple of weeks straight. I, I can't tell you how it brings a smile on my face to wake up in my own bed every morning. Well, let's put it this way. You're not really off of work, though, Mike. I mean, It just changes. It, I mean, it, instead of doing legislative work, I'm doing a lot of the meetings that I couldn't do when I'm in D.C., you know, a lot of community events, that kind of stuff. So you got two solid weeks of constituent services and still trying to fit the family in there at some point. Yeah, we have, uh, my wife is Orthodox, so I have two Easter's during this break. There you the go. Orthodox Easter and the, and the Catholic Easter. There you go. Let's start. Yep. What on, what's on a lot of people's minds is what is going on within the Trump administration. <laughs> You've got a bird's eye view. Being in Washington, you have the ear of all the other legislators, senators, representatives. Is there a general consensus that this ship is kind of floating in the ocean, or is there some kind of direction? I think you're being kind. I think the general, the Democrats in general think that what the, we feel the same, well, what the heck is going on? And it's not because we disagree or agree, it's because we don't see a direction on almost anything. It's all over the ballpark. Uh, the Republicans won't say it publicly, they're trying to be good team players, but when they talk to us in private capacity, they're just as confused and um, concerned as we are. Hmm. Any, any clear cut direction on what's going to happen with the rest of his cabinet? I mean, <laughs> it, well, I mean, how many, I've lost count of how many have left. Yeah, they, there's, uh, the TV shows that do it, they're running out of space for the pictures. Uh, it's, it's just stunning. And, and to be perfectly honest, I mean, it's always amazing to me. Some of my friends will say, oh, we're glad so and so is gone. And my answer is always, be careful, there's somebody worse. And, and I think, you know, Mr. Bolton is proof positive of it. You know, whether you liked or didn't like McMaster, uh, he had some respect, and, and again, he didn't seem like he was going to break anything. John Bolton scares me, and he scares me because of his past record, his past commentary, both as a public servant and when he was out as a commentator. I think he's a very dangerous man based on his words, and uh, I'm not so sure. I'm sure that's not an improvement. I'm sure that's a, a, a bigger problem, and that's the case across the board. Each time somebody new comes in, if you know them, uh, the ones I've known, it's like, oh, wow, I didn't realize you could go further in that direction. Well, do you think it's a case of where, you know, the more professional career mm. folks who have been in government all these years are just saying, we don't want any part of it? Yeah, I think that's some of it, absolutely. I mean, why would you want to get onto a ship like this, especially if you're a professional, whatever, uh, you've done this before as Secretary of State or some undersecretary, why would you want to jump onto a ship that the very next day your own boss could be tweeting in public about how much he hates you? Right. Um, it's not the kind of thing that would attract... Uh, we're talking top-notch professionals that are respected within their field, and there's a lot of them. Why would you want to get involved with that? It's so, an odd place to be these days, isn't it? Yeah, being kind. It's more than that. It, it really, it's like bizarro world. And again, I mean, I, I, I have to admit, it's easy for me to say that because I don't like the policies that I'm aware of that the Trump administration is pushing. But that's not what I'm talking about. I didn't like George Bush's policies either but I didn't feel the same way about him as I, as I do about, about this administration. But there was a level of decorum. There yes. was a level of civility. Yes. That seems to, and it's coming from the top. Very much so. Vulgar, kind of crude way of governing. It's, and look, you know, I'm no babe in the woods. I mean, I understand crudeness. I can be just as crude as anybody else. We'll do that off camera, Mike. But when you're the president of the United States, you have a certain obligation right. to, to raise the bar. And if you want to be crude in the back room, you know, so be it. Uh, and that's why some of the things that have been said about him, you know, I kind of think a little unfair if he's talking to somebody he he doesn't he thinks is his friend, but then he does it in public, and, and, right. and intentionally tweets about it himself, and that's the kind of stuff that I say, uh, that scares me. Yeah, it's a distraction. I just wanted to kind of get your take to make sure that you know, coming from somebody who's in the middle of it, in uh, you know, five six days a week down there, yep. you're seeing the same thing that we're seeing on the news. Very much so. Right. So his actions. I think it's going to define his presidency, yeah. his own actions, not any scandal down below, his own personal behavior. The scandals are the least of my concerns, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, the scandals are bad, uh, but in the, in the final analysis, they won't necessarily impact 
the country or the world. I mean, they may be interesting and might be embarrassing for the country, but they're not going to get us into World War III. They're not going to collapse the economy. Right. And some of the other things he's doing could very well do those types right. of things. Well, I, I, I think people know how you feel about the current administration. Uh, let's move on to the Congress itself. Um, there is still that feeling out there. You have your ear to the ground. I have my ear to the ground. Is that Congress is dysfunctional, mm -hmm. primarily because you have two warring factions, Democrats and the Republicans. Republicans are in control, but there's light. There's a little bit of light out there this year in the midterms that Democrats could take some of those solid Republican seats. Your take? It, it, I think it's oversimplification to think it's Democrat and Republican because there's actually at least three factions, if not four. And I say that because the Republican Party is having a massive fight within itself between its Tea Party and its more moderate members. And the Tea Party has been winning. The Democratic Party has been a little bit more together, as much as we ever get together. Uh, lately, though, there have been some breaks along some of the, uh, the, 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 the more progressive groups and some of those. You're talking about the R revolution versus yeah, the more mainstream and, and, Democratic. And, and that, to me, is troubling because it's not because we have to agree. It's because I don't think there's any doubt that pretty much any Democrat on the ballot is going to be much better than pretty much any Republican. Now, that's a generalization, but I feel comfortable saying that. Um, all that being said, and plus, I don't want to fall into the same trap the Republicans find themselves. They, they're having problems because they cannot find the majority within themselves, and then their own minority, the Tea Party, will not allow the rest of the Republicans to then deal with Democrats. If they do, they punish them, and they run Republicans in them uh, against primaries, and the Koch brothers come in and say they're, they're rhinos, they're only Republicans. Is that and different, only. though, in the Democratic Party? It has been up until, uh, it's not happening yet, but there are, there are some signs that it could happen. Um, in general, we have our primary fights, and that's fine, that's normal, we all pick a side, we all fight about it. But in the end, we look up, and again, even this last election, it happened. You know, when Hillary Clinton ran against Barack Obama and she lost, you know, the Clinton people weren't happy, but took a deep breath, looked at it, and they said, well, Obama or, 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 the, or the Republican, and, and it was an easy choice. Mm -hmm. uh, this time it happened. It took a little longer with some of the Sanders people to, I think they thought that some of the, and it may be rightfully so, that the party and some others treated them unfairly. And I'm not saying that they're wrong, but was there any doubt that Hillary Clinton would have been better than uh, Donald Trump, and some people wonder. And my argument is, look, that may be good in a philosophical class in high school. It is not good for the issues that have mattered to me. Uh, I've, I've said from day one, had Hillary Clinton won, I would have been fighting with her the next day, but it would have been a different fight. It would have been a family fight at Thanksgiving mm -hmm. over exactly how much we can do for affordable housing. It wouldn't be the kind of fights I'm having with Donald Trump now. Right, right. Well, I can't help but noticing you've got your, you're proudly displaying your button today. Yes. <laughs> which um, it gives the grade from the NRA. Yeah. You've been at the bottom of that pile for many, many years now. Yeah. You consistently get an F from the <laughs> NRA. So let's move on. There's the topic of the day, gun control. The recent uh, march on Washington and marches across the country right. is, it gives me, it gives me great, great enthusiasm that this next generation that's coming along gets this whole issue about gun control. I, I hope so. I also hope it, 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 it's it got to be more than just about gun control. I hope it also empowers them to say it matters. And it matters, yes, on gun control, but it also matters on housing, on education, on, on, on food quality, you know, all kinds of things, the environment. Um, I think and I think the kids are doing a great job. Uh, they're, they're educated, they're well-spoken, they're respectful. Um, but I, I think there's still a question, will they persevere? And I hope so. I really hope so. It would be a great thing if they do. But I'm telling you one thing. Unequivocally, the NRA is counting on this being a blip in the screen again. And they're counting on all of us kind of saying in a few weeks or a month or whatever it's going to be, uh, what's for dinner? And, and I hope that doesn't happen. I think these kids have, uh, have captured the American imagination. They've really kind of galvanized us on one issue. I think we've made some progress on it already. We have more to do. And I think we got a chance for the first time in a long time. I was looking at your record, your NRA record, and, and you know, I, I would have to tell you is that there are probably a handful of congress, congressmen, women, and senators who have consistently gotten an F from the NRA. So I don't think there's anybody who, it, it's not ambiguous as to where you stand no, it's with easy. those folks. And I'm not trying to take anybody's gun away. I'm simply trying to put, I think, to be reasonable controls like we have in Massachusetts that work um, I'm not, if you're a law-abiding, mentally stable citizen, you can get a gun. If you have to wait for a week 
life will go on. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have to wait a week or 10 days to get a background check, what's the problem? Why do you need it right this second? Right. It works well here, and I think those are the kinds of things we should be doing on the national level. Um, the Congress just passed a budget. Yep. Huge budget. Your thoughts? This particular budget was much better than many people, including me, expected. Uh, Democrats got a fair amount of uh, good things in it. Um, but I still voted no, and I voted no because everything I have a vote on is some good and some bad. It's always a balance of that. This budget had some good money in there for transportation, some good money in there for housing, some good money in there for health care. It, it didn't it had some terrible things in there on privacy. It allowed the, not just the American police, but now international police mm -hmm. to get information on you without a warrant, which is just stunning to me that we would pass a law that would allow that to do that. Uh, it bulked up the defense budget way, way, way too much. It, uh, it didn't do anything. It busted the, 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 uh, the national debt again. And again, I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a debt hawk, but you know, there's a certain amount of debt that's legit, and there's another level of debt that really is intended in the long run to empower the Republicans in a year or two or three to say, the debt's a problem, let's slash social programs. And that scares me. So for me, I, I voted no, I'm glad I did. But again, no, I've never voted yes or no where everything was all good or all bad. Real quick on this one, do you think there's a correlation between how President Trump is trying to load up his cabinet with military people versus how much money he actually loaded up for the military budget? It's hard to tell. I mean, I think from, from where I stand, I mean, the military buildup is really about business. I think it's more, let's build more ships that, they, that even the Navy will tell you they don't want. Let's build planes that the Air Force will tell you they don't want. It's, it's not so much about building up the number of men and women in the, in the services or giving them pay raises or giving them personal equipment that will help them in the field. It's more about the toys. Uh, big toys that are important, but if, if the Navy says we don't need an extra you know, uh, aircraft carrier, I think that's a pretty reliable source, and therefore we shouldn't force them to have another one. Maybe some, somebody's got contracts in the background that I, may come I to think light at some the, point. A lot of that has to do with that. One of the things that I know that you have always been passionate about, and we hear at the Media Center, thank you for it, is net neutrality. Oh, yeah. And that's coming up soon on April 23rd, I think, is when the executive or order kicks in. Yep. Um, on behalf of us down here, I know you're going to be serving on a panel uh, soon with other media centers talking about the importance of net neutrality. Um, is there anything that Congress can do at this point to yeah, overturn very what, much so. the, what the, the president the, has done? In the House and the Senate, the, in the House, each committee has a responsibility. The, the gentleman who's in charge of the, the subcommittee in charge of this particular area is Mike Doyle out of Pittsburgh. He's a good personal friend. We actually hang out together all the time. Uh, he's the lead guy on this, and he's immediately put together one of those uh, resolutions that will repeal the regulation, exactly what the Republicans did to Barack Obama's regulations mm -hmm. last year. We're going to try to do this regulation. And the whole idea is, I, I guarantee you, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm absolutely positive that there are a lot of Republicans that allowed this to happen that can't explain it at home and are scared to death of it because as soon as people realize what it does, you know, people already know nobody wants this. Even the companies that will benefit from it have all publicly and loudly said, oh, no, we won't do those terrible things. Where's it coming things. from? Where's the... Because they're only kidding. Right. And, and I, don't blame, I don't blame the companies. I don't blame the big tech companies because they're going to make a gazillion dollars out of this. Um, so I'm not, I don't blame anybody for trying to make money. I blame us for allowing them to make that kind of money on the backs of regular people that it's inappropriate and unnecessary. They're already making a lot of money. God bless them. I use them like everybody else does. They don't need to do this. And, and, and the average person, and I was one of them, if you would ask me about net neutrality a year and a half ago, I would say, I don't know, I'm, yeah, I'm for that neutral stuff. Neutral mm -hmm. sounds good. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's actually a misnomer. What neutrality is, is that when you get service through your internet, each item is allowed to travel to me at the same speed as opposed to somebody else in the back curtain turning down the it's speed. It's about equity and fairness. It's equity and fairness, and it's about, and I will tell you, the innovation will come to a standstill because it'll be only the big companies that'll be able to afford to move quickly. And if you're sitting at your computer clicking and saying, I want that page, I want that page, and it takes an hour to come up, mm -hmm. you're going to move on to another page that That's comes right. up fast. And, the, and right. it's going gonna, it's gonna to really hinder um, innovation. Yeah, I hope the uh, listening public understands, you know, that there are all kinds of articles out there. Yeah. We're going to be replaying your participation in the panel on uh, a lot of the local media stations. Um, I hope they do understand that it has wide-ranging implications. So you need to contact your, your yeah. congressional delegation and your, Senate, your senators. Let's move on a little bit more. Um, 
the Affordable Care Act, um, President Trump um, practically mandated that he was going to blow that up. Where is it now? Uh, well, they're, they're trying to do it through the back door because they couldn't do it through the front door. Their own, their own members got afraid of what they were actually doing. Once people found out what was in the bill, and look, again, everything in every bill, there are things you like and things you don't. But overall, the American public likes this bill. And, and, and now that they've seen it and they've got it, they say, well, why would you want to take that away? Why would you want to take pre-existing conditions away from me? Everybody I know over an age of 45 has some sort of pre-existing condition. And now they wouldn't be able to get health insurance. So, so they, they tried to come in the front door. They got stopped. They got stopped because the American public stood up and said, wait a minute, that's not what we meant. But they're going to try to come through the back door. Right now, as we speak, this budget, one of the reasons I voted against it, it didn't do anything about insurance increases. We're about to get hit with increases in the insurance rates on the ACA. Again. That, and these are going to be significant, mm -hmm. probably in the fall at some point. And we had an opportunity to do something about it, and they chose not to. That's one of the reasons. I, that's one of the main reasons I voted against this budget. Um, so come the fall, when you see increases in your health insurance, um, you know where it came from. So I want to stay just for a couple of more minutes, Mike, on the congressional side of things. Rumors have been swirling over the past week that the speaker, Paul Ryan, may be thinking about exiting, in conjunction with the very real possibility that the Democrats will could retain or regain control right. of the House. Your thoughts on that in terms of Trump's agenda? Well, his agenda will then be stopped. If the Democrats take the House over, there will be no Trump agenda that will pass, um, which I don't know what that'll do to him. It, it makes one of two things happen. Either he becomes the transactional businessman that some people were hoping for in the beginning, or he gets more strident and becomes more right wing and and nothing. And maybe more happen. isolated from more, both his own party certainly and Certainly more the isolated if that's what he does. Um, either way, it's difficult for him. And my answer is that's what elections are all about. It's difficult for us right now. Uh, I think the chances of us taking the House back are pretty good. Uh, they're not perfect. Like I know some people want to beat their chest and think the election's over. That's a huge mistake. Um, the country is divided. Um, you know, it's not just Trump, but the Republican Party has the hearts and minds of give or take 50% of the people. Each election is a battle in itself, then each, it's not a, not a national election, it's individual districts. So you have to have the right candidate, you have to have the right message. Uh, the, the message has to be changed a little bit for each candidate. I, for instance, my F in the NRA won't work for a Democrat running in Mississippi. And, you know, and, that's, and we have to be tolerant of that to a certain extent. So I, I think the chances are good. Um, I hope so, to be perfectly honest. If not, I think the country's in trouble, and I'll tell you why. It's the one thing that's missing is if we win, great, the agenda stops and we begin the process of trying to take the White House back and all that. If they win, they're going to go back to Washington next January thumping their chest saying, after all this, America now has just said officially they like what we're doing. And now we're going to step on the gas and do it even more. So if they keep the House in the Senate, I think that those of us who don't agree with their agenda are in for a very, very, very bumpy ride. So let me give you a scenario. The Democrats take control of the House. You've got a lot of seniority. You serve on a lot of the committees now. Any chairmanships in the offing for Mike Capuano? Probably a, a chairmanship on the, on the Housing and Insurance uh, Committee, um, probably there, maybe on transportation, uh, the, rail, uh, the rail committee, uh, which actually does subways and commuter rails and all that. Um, uh, both of those are actually probably mine for the taking, if you want the truth. Uh, because seniority matters. And, you know, you can argue about it. I used to argue about it when I was a more junior member. Uh, but <laughs> I used to argue. How times and, change, Mike. Well, and you argue and you're lost. So it, seniority hasn't changed. And it's right. not going to change in the near future. So that, uh, yeah, it, it means, and plus we have Richie Neal at Ways and Means and Jim McGovern at the Rules Committee. Massachusetts is in a position to do very well if Democrats take the place back. But you are um, going to be losing one of your longtime stalwarts, yep. Nikki Songas. Yep decided not to run. Yep, and, and that's natural. I mean, I, 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 we, I've been through this a while now. I've heard everybody lament when Ted Kennedy passed. Oh, my God, nothing will ever happen again. Uh, and then when John Kerry left, nothing, you know, and, and then Bonnie Frank and John Oliver. And that's true. I mean, this is a cycle. And Massachusetts has done a pretty good job, not intentionally, but just has happened, that as new people come in, there's enough seniority to maintain the balance 
and they stick around long enough so that the junior people will become senior, and it starts all over again. So forgive my ignorance, are you the now going to be the most senior on the congressional delegation? No, no, third. No, uh, Jim third. McGovern came in one term before Jim me, McGovern. and, uh, and uh, Richie Neal came in two, three terms, or four terms before me. Talking about transportation, nice segue. We're going to take it down to the local level here. Um, you know, every time somebody talks about the Green Line in the city of Cambridge, Somerville, and Medford, I am always saying, well, you know, those are our congressional folks that you're going to have to thank. So we are well on our way. Yeah, um, we are. A lot of the work has begun. Um, the different neighborhoods all have different representatives for the construction part of it. So transportation-wise, though, we still have an issue with roads, bridges, and oh, yeah. other modes of transportation. Oh, yeah. Are you going to stay with the transportation part of it? Because you've, you've yeah, done that Yeah, transportation is critical. And it's not just about transportation. Transportation is about getting people back and forth to work and not spending 42 hours in the, in the car or on a bus waiting to do that. Um, you know, it does matter. If you want to increase business opportunities and you want to increase jobs, you need to be able to get back and forth uh, relatively easily. Boston has a long way to go. We have, I think, in my opinion, we've ignored our transportation issues for too many years. Um, I hope that we really spend some time doing it, and I hope if we're in the majority, I'm in a position to help that along. Speaking of Boston, you don't only represent uh, Somerville, parts of Cambridge and beyond. You represent the core of, this, of Boston itself. That's right. They've had some flooding problems oh, yeah. recently. You're on the environment on the environmental side, Mike. Is there something that the local municipality, the city of Boston, can do itself? Yeah, there are. There are there are things they can do. But again, it's all expensive. It's expensive. They, I think just yesterday, the day before, uh, they came out with a study that showed about two and a half billion dollars worth of investments. Not even the biggest numbers. Uh, the answer is yes. They can do things in, on on sewer capacity, on runoff capacity, which like some of them did on uh, on some of the lab not too long ago. Uh, they can do things on, on building up walls across all, along the oceans, uh, sea walls mostly, making, making sure they're tall enough, making sure they're strong enough and in, in, in working water. There are things that can be done, uh, various traps in the, in, the, uh, in the sewer system to make sure it doesn't back up. And, you know, you, get, you asked a question, you're going to get a technical answer to a certain extent. Um, but it all costs money. You don't just drop a trap into a, into a you got to dig it up all the way down 20, 30, 40, 50 feet sometimes. Uh, it takes time, it takes money, and it's got to be planned out, uh, particularly when it comes to building new buildings. When, uh, those new buildings need to be built with that in mind. And some of them have been, not all of them have been. So the waterfront in Boston is in a precarious position yeah, unless is. we get some federal funding to assist the city itself. It's that, and again, make sure that people who do build buildings down there, there's still some more being built, build it in a way that is uh, that will withstand these things. Uh, honestly, one of my biggest fears is about Logan Airport. Uh, it's one thing if we lose a building or two or even the entire seaport, but if we lose Logan Airport, uh, that is a real regional economic problem. Uh, and not because I love where Logan is, but would like it or not, it is the regional airport. And I guess we'd have to go to Bedford, which of course would be very difficult because it's not really built to take the capacity that Logan does. So either way, uh, that's a problem. And I've, I think most everybody knows that Logan Airport is all landfill and right on the ocean. and. Um, it's something that people need to be aware of. Yeah, I don't think we're going to see the end to the um, the uh, debate on the environment and no. global warming. <laughs> That's not going to come to any time no. uh, to an end anytime mm -hmm. soon, no matter who's in the White House. That's right. So let's talk about local. You got an opponent this year. Big difference between you and your opponent. I don't know. Um, my opponent has been running now for about a month, three weeks, four, four weeks, and to my knowledge, there has not been one issue. Uh, mentioned that she dis disagrees with me on. Uh, I've been looking forward my to it. My bad on that. I should have said Ayanna Presley, one of yes. the Boston City Council women. And, yep. and, and, and that's all well good, but I find it hard to believe that you can run against somebody with a record. I have a long record. That's, I mean, everybody loves everything I do. I know that. But you know, I'm going to be running on my record. What I have done, which not so much that anybody's going to vote for me what I did yesterday, but what I have done, I think, indicates what I might do tomorrow. Um, and if you don't have a difference with that, then you're going to have to explain, you know, why you should be here and not me. And thus far, to be perfectly honest, uh, I haven't heard anything. I think a lot of folks are going to be watching. The uh, state convention mm -hmm. is coming up in June. Um, I took myself out of it as a delegate, so mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about me being out there, but I will be out there as a member of the media. So Good. hopefully we will see you around town. I know you got a jam-packed week, next two weeks. Yep. So we'll see you around Somerville. Nice to see you, John. And one of the best things is you're a Ward 5 guy in the city of That's Somerville. That's right. So I am. am I. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Joe. My guest has been Congressman Michael Capuano from the 7th Congressional District 
in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thanks for watching. As always, stay safe, stay informed. See you next time.